Welcome to the job interview experience. I'm a former executive recruiter, search firm owner, director of talent acquisition, and today, the founder of Candidate Club Interview Prep and your host of the job interview experience. One of the things that I think makes this podcast helpful to you is that I bring you a perspective from the other side of the table as you. You, the job seeker, and the hosts, a recruiter. I put a lot of effort into bringing you great guests, especially guests with a perspective that you need to hear, but you may not have thought of or sought out. Some of the best lessons you can learn are from what I call the other side of the table, and that's why I'm excited to have Lou Adler with us today. Lou Adler is the CEO and founder of the Adler Group, a consulting firm and training firm helping companies implement win-win hiring programs using his performance-based hiring system for finding and hiring exceptional talent. Lou thinks outside the box and realized that the hiring process was broken, and many of you listening also feel like the hiring process is broken, as do I. Lou decided to do something about it and invented what's now famously known as the performance-based hiring model. With over 40 years in the recruiting industry, Lou's company, The Adler Group, has trained over over 40,000 hiring managers and placed over 1,500 executives for many of the fastest-growing companies with clients including Disney, General Dynamics, and Paycom. His articles and research have also been featured in Inc. Magazine, Business Insider, Bloomberg, SHRM, which is a HR thing for those of you who don't know, and The Wall Street Journal, in my opinion. And now, probably the biggest and most important of all, obviously, you're seeing Lou on the job interview experience. He's also the host of the Almost Daily Recruiting Show, focused on addressing the challenges involved in diversity, hiring without compromise. Lou is here to help you understand how hiring professionals think and how they view you and obviously how you can use that to improve your career your job search, and your interview performance. Lou, I need a break after that long intro. Welcome, Lou. Yeah, you do, yeah. Hey, thank you, Matthew. Yeah, no, this will be fun. I uh, appreciate that long introduction. Uh, I would actually say I'm thinking of writing an article. I thought of it last night, which was everything about the hiring process is broken. Uh, And I think it is. Uh, So it's incumbent upon candidates to fix it for themselves. Because they will not be interviewed properly, they will not be onboarded properly. Well, they might be onboarded properly, but there's so many things that are broken that candidates take it too personal. It's usually not them; it's usually the company that's messed up. So we'll try to hopefully navigate through some of those landmines here today and help people through the process that is kind of kind of messed up. Unfortunately, Lou, a lot of professionals in the HR business, and I think this is maybe what's caused people like you and I to stand out. A lot of people in this business don't like change. They, I think they like the rigidity and it is safer that way. Um, but companies that want to hire and find great people and stand out in the hiring process, they have to change. Uh, and we can get to that. But to, to me, uh, just like a job interview, I care about getting to know you personally before we dig deeper. So tell me when you aren't working, what are you passionate about in life? Well, I don't know that I'm ever not working. So that's kind of a hard question. I knew you were going to set me up for that, and I didn't even think about coming up with an answer. So um, my hobby is actually a segment of American history from 1850 to 1900. So that's my hobby. But I'm actually passionate about hiring. I know that sounds odd. And understanding why my opening statement was, Hiring is screwed up. Really, people are doing the wrong things, and I've been doing the wrong things for years. I've been around for a lot of years, uh, and it surprises me. People spend tens of billions of dollars to be more efficient doing the wrong things. So I'm passionate about why people do that. Unfortunately, I haven't figured out a solution. I kind of know at the individual candidate and hiring manager and job level how to do it. But at scale, people revert back, hey, we got to do this faster, cheaper, quicker, and in the process, um, hire people who aren't necessarily qualified or interested in what they have to do. So that is what I find fascinating 
And I do think about that all the time, even given the history of the United States and how we became what we are today, which is kind of surprising we're even here. But we don't need to get into that. Can you please fill in the blanks for, for me on anything I might have missed and just help our audi- audience understand um, what it is you do today? Okay, what I do is uh, I write articles and stories and books about the hiring process. As a company, I do have a company that trains recruiters and hiring managers on how to do that process more effectively in what you introduced as performance-based hiring. It's how you take the assignment. It's how you find candidates. It's how you interview candidates. It's how you negotiate offers. I did write a book called The Essential Guide for Hiring and Getting Hired about five or eight, uh, eight years ago now, which gave a viewpoint to candidates on what they should do because they probably will not be assessed properly. Uh, but I, but my real focus is on companies to try to get them to do it right. But it's really incumbent upon the candidate to ensure that they're being assessed properly. And most often they're not. So my company, and I'm kind of semi-retired, so that's why I, I do have a company that does this and we still are pretty busy, but I don't care as much about that. I still try to figure out why is this thing broken and why can't we get it fixed? And People ask me, is anything going to change? And I said, I don't think so. But I think candidates have the chance to change it, at least for them at the one-on-one level with that manager, that job, and that uh, opportunity. Well, here's the thing. Will, this, will the system change? No. There's com- there are companies, my guess would be small to medium-sized companies, that can change, and they will thrive if they do. And that, you know, it'll be interesting to watch who evolves and, and who doesn't, because it, it will make a big impact on who gets hires and who retains people. Lou, your audience is hiring professionals. My audience is job seekers. What do the two parties get wrong about each other? I think it starts, let me go back 44 years, because I think that's really, and this is really the genesis of why they get it wrong. My first search assignment, and I didn't, when I became a recruiter in 1978, it wasn't my first job. The day before I became a recruiter, I was running a manufacturing company making automotive components with 300 people in it. I hated the group president, literally hated him. Every time he came by, and he was my boss, every time he came by, I quit. I mean, literally, it was then he came by every two to three weeks, I quit. And I said, oh, when he's gone, I'll start doing my job. But then I, so it took me a year to actually quit. And I told them I was going to quit, and they didn't believe me, and I finally quit. Uh, And I became a recruiter because I figured that would be a way to find another job. But my first assignment was for a plant manager, also in the automotive industry. And I knew the president of the company, told him I was going to become a recruiter. He said, fine, I need a plant manager. Come on over the day you got. So the second day I became a recruiter, had this search assignment for a plant manager. And he had a list as a job description, a typical job description in 1978, bunch of skills, a bunch of experiences, 10 years of this, background here, competencies, academic background, industry background. And I looked at it and I said, Mike, this is not a job description. This is a person description. A job doesn't have skills, experience, and competencies and academic background. That's a person. Let's put the job, the person description in the parking lot. What does the person need to do to be successful? And he said, wow, I never thought of that. I need someone to turn the plant around. I said, fine, let's walk through the plant. So I spent an hour walking through the plant with him. And we, it was a terrible plant. And I worked. Because I had a manufacturing background, it was easy to walk through any kind of plant, whether it was electronics, high volume assembly, uh, custom plants, automotive plants, electronic, it didn't matter. Felt very comfortable in the plant. Seven things needed to be turned around. I said, find somebody who can do that. Three weeks later, we found a candidate who could do that work. Had some of the background on the job description, but not the same. Different industry, but doing similar kind of products, similar kind of manufacturing, hired a person. Uh, and I have never used the job description that lists skills, experience, and companies since that day. I always ask the hiring manager, what does the person need to do to be successful? And every single candidate in the world should start with that phrase. If they're in an interview and they feel like they're being uh, interviewed improperly, just stop and say, can you tell me a little bit about the job and what the person in this role needs to do for you in order to be considered successful? Because I'd like to give you some stories of things I've done that are most comparable. That's how you control the interview. That's how ensure you're interviewed properly. And to me, it's that mismatch that starts the whole problem. If you don't know the job 
And then candidates don't know the job. They're interviewed improperly and they take a job that they don't know what it's like until they start and then they're disappointed. So that's the genesis of everything. Matthew, if you get that part right, you're in the game. Sorry for that long answer, but that's the, that's the story. I'll ask you two parts of this. It's kind of the same question or same idea. What do you think makes a great recruiter? What would you think would be maybe one or two attributes that stand out and, and, help a person represent a company well, but also help a person bring in people who can do the job? Well, I think that's real critical. I just had a course this morning for 25 recruiters on it. Uh, and I basically said, if you don't know the job, you're selling smoke and mirrors. I mean, it's you're affecting a person's life. Uh, so if you don't know the job, all you're selling is uh, oh, an awesome opportunity. It's great here. And what's the comp? And you're selling stuff that's, at best, an ill-defined lateral transfer. Uh, and you're coming across as a, a used salesman, a used car salesman. So in my mind, knowing the job is most important. Without that, you're in the game. The second most is the hiring manager. Do you know that person, that manager's style? Because reality is the culture of a company, 75% is that hiring manager. I actually liked that job that I had. I actually, The one I had where I quit. I mean, I really liked it. I didn't like the group president. He came and thought I was a big screw up. I was 31 years old, so maybe I was a screw up, but I didn't. I still liked it and I was being reasonably successful at it. And I really liked the work. I didn't like him. Uh, that was it. So when you think, and I liked the culture of the company, I liked everything about it. I didn't like him. So the culture of the company largely manifested itself in that hiring manager. So now as a recruiter, know the job, know the hiring manager, and know how decisions are made and the process of decision making. Because you look at the hiring manager and the process of decision making, you pretty well have the culture. If you like to make fast decisions without a lot of research, that's a different culture uh, versus I've got to go through these layers of bureaucracy. But to me, you can the whole culture of a company is defined by the quality of the leadership skills of the hiring manager and how company decisions are made. Big decisions, not minor. Big de well, decisions. You get those things right in the job, you're in the game. And a recruiter should know those things and trying to make sure that they uh, get a good proper match. So we we have the, our good recruiter now. How does a good recruiter filter out candidates that are good at interviewing versus candidates that are well qualified for the job? Well, to me, if they can't do that, they shouldn't be a recruiter. Uh, and people say, a lot of candidates say they can, they can get any job. No, they can con somebody. This is exactly how you get a recruiter who cons candidates. You get candidates who con recruiters. I, ha I wrote an article on LinkedIn, probably the first article I ever wrote on LinkedIn when they came out with, and this is eight, maybe 10 years ago now, they had their influencer program. I knew some folks at LinkedIn. They asked me to write an article because I'd written a couple books. And I wrote a post, which I'm going to say is, could still be the number one article ever written on LinkedIn. 1.5 million reads, maybe 2 million now. The article title was the most, uh, the most important interview question of all time. Might not be exactly that, but it's something like the most important interview question of all time. The question is, and I would ask every single candidate this question to prevent the con game. Con game is, Matthew, tell me about the best thing you've ever done in your entire career. You've got 15 minutes to tell me about the best work you've ever done. 15 minutes. And I'm going to ask but when you happened, who did it with, why you got assigned the project. Walk, you're going to walk me 15 minutes step by step through that accomplishment. Now, the reality of it is, you'll probably be able to talk one or two minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll then have to pull the rest of it out of you. If you talk too much, I'll time out. Hey, Matthew, no, you said this happened in this date. I'll start really coning in and getting specific data and details with names, facts, uh, years, months, this whole bit. You cannot con uh, that question. I mean, it gets right to the heart of it. So now that I've got the right answer, I then have to compare that. Remember, when I went into the uh, hiring manager, take the in. The interview said, tell me about the biggest thing you want this person to do. I then can see if there's a match. So now I've got the hiring manager talking reality. I talk to the candidate talking reality, and I see if there's a fit there. I mean, so uh, you have to know the job. Candidates have to be able to describe their most significant accomplishment. And you get you match the two, you know you're in the game anyway. There's more to it than that. But, boy, you got 50 to 60% of it right there with those two questions. For our audience listening, I, I know that you're job seekers. Lou and I... You're going to find, as our conversation goes on, you're going to learn from what we're discussing here, even though it's this episode is not about you so much. This is about uh, the other side of the table. 
So the next question I have, I think what I want to do is I'm going to name two red flags that I've learned over time about candidates, and I'll ask you to name one or two red flags. Patterns you've seen when, when candidates start doing these things that it's time to pump the brakes and really think hard if this person is is going to be a good long-term hire. Uh, the first one for me that comes to mind, uh, and this is probably a little bit more in like mid-level management um, or or kind of management leadership positions, candidates that acted like they were doing you a favor by showing up and interviewing with you, that – and the confidence is good. I encourage my audience to not show up and seem desperate, like this is the only job in the world. Candidates that would show up and kind of say, hey, well, you know, you you know, you know, wanted to talk to me. I'm giving you my time. I'll, we'll make this work – uh, you know, ac- according to me and, and the kind of that standoffish nature, those people never seem to ever be happy and they never seem to last very long. The other thing is uh, candidates that during the offer time, obviously it's good to negotiate. It's good to make sure it works out well for both parties so both people are happy. Candidates that would go on and on in the negotiation and just email after email after email versus phone calls where they're just not sure – those people are also, I would find after we hired them, they just never lasted the same way as people would say something as simple as, oh, you know, actually I need this much and then it works. And then you make the adjustments, maybe to the small adjustments, the offer, and then you're done. Uh, those are two red flags for me. would love to hear from your point of view, whether it be any type of job candidate, any type of applicant, what are some red flags that pop up for you? Well, the thing is I prevent both of those uh, early on in the process, and I think they're both legitimate. But one thing that's a red flag for me is during the, and I don't invite anybody in for a full interview. I always, always, always conduct an exploratory phone screen, 15 yep. or 20 yep. minutes. And it's, and it's just, hey, let's just chat to see if it will even make sense if the opportunity that I'm representing is good for you or not. Uh, so I always do that. But during that initial interview, I always ask candidates, hey, Matthew, why did you go from job A to job B? And did you get what you want? And candidates, I, I left job A uh, because I want a growth and opportunity. Uh, well, did it happen? Well, no, they promised me this and it didn't happen. I said, why'd you go from job B to job C? Well, they promised me growth and opportunity, uh, but then it didn't happen. And I call that job hopping syndrome. So very quickly, I know it's the candidate is looking for something, but they made superficial short-term decisions. They always focus on what they get on the start date, not the job mm-hmm. itself, because they didn't ask the question, what does the person need to do to be successful? Uh, so now all of a sudden, they're making decisions based on what they did in the start date, not on the career opportunity. So now that gets to your point. Uh, so what I do very early in the interview, when I see a candidate uh, who I think is effective, I say, candidate, and let's assume it's Matthew. Hey, Matthew, I really like your background. Uh, I'm going to probably present three or four candidates to the hiring manager. Uh, and one of you is probably going to get a job offer. But I want to set the stage right now how you're going to make a decision if you're the candidate who gets the job offer. And whether you get it from me or anyone else, I think you should take this advice regardless. Before I actually make you the offer, I'm going to say, forget the money. Forget the money. Do you really want this job? And I'm going to expect you to define the job in non-monetary terms. And I'm hoping to give you what I call a 30% non-monetary increase. Call it the 30% solution. If you don't get 30% out of this job, do not take it no matter what we pay you. The 30% non-monetary, some of it's job stretch, bigger Mm -hmm. job, bigger budget, bigger team. Some of it's faster growth. You're growing faster than you're going there. Some of it's going to be a work-life balance or a mix of more satisfying work. Sometimes it's going to be more important work. But I'm going to tell you before we make the offer is forget the money. Do you want this job? And you're going to say yes. I'm going to say, tell me why. Forget the money. Because if you don't tell me why, I'm not going to make you an offer. And the truth is, if we make you a competitive offer, it's not going to matter. The money is not going to matter. What's going to matter is the non-competitive factors. That will drive your satisfaction and your growth and where you'll be a year from now. So I'm, the compensation, what you get a start is nothing. It's so what you get on year one and year two. It's going to be more important. Because that's if I can put you on a faster career path, your compensation will be taken care of. Might be, if we got to be competitive in the short term, but what we really want to be is aggressive in the long term. And most candidates focus too much on what they get the start date. So those are how I prevent that issue. But it's a critical of candidates. And this is, I've done this thousands, of, not thousands, hundreds and hundreds of times. And too many candidates make short-term decisions and suppose to long-term decisions. And I don't let them. Speaking of those attitudes and, and ways to, I guess, filter 
candidates and what they want versus what they don't want. How have you seen job seekers approach or attitudes change over time? In the intro I mentioned, um, I think you have 40 years in the industry. So you uh, over the decades, have you seen candidates over, I guess, different economies, recessions, ups, downs? How have you seen them change? You know, now we're in 2022 versus 10, 20 plus years ago. Yeah, I think that the problem is, and it goes both sides. I think candidates overvalue what they get on the start date, compensation, title, location, the superficialities, and don't do enough due diligence on the work itself. And and companies do the same thing. They post just job descriptions that look nothing more than this uh, ill-defined lateral transfer. And they find, so they find people who are going to make short-term decisions. You've got companies making short-term decisions, and both are responsible for that. And I don't think anything has changed over the 30 years. And I ask candidates, candidate, what's the comp? I said, forget the comp for a minute. Think about the best job you've ever had in your life. Best job. Best job. The one that you went into work and you enjoyed what you're doing, you enjoyed the people. Was it about the money or was it about something else? And if it was something else, tell me what those are and look for those in your next job. And so few candidates get, uh, and I'll go to, um, uh, they avoid pain. I mean, what the big, ah, I don't like this job, I'm unhappy, so I'll take another job that has the superficialities of avoiding pain. So avoiding short-term pain overvalues long-term gain. And it's constant, that's human nature, and I don't think that's changed. And unfortunately, now people can change jobs easier. 20 or 30 years ago, it was hard to change a job. There was no LinkedIn. There was no job boards. It was hard work to change that. You got to look at the newspaper, find a job, send an email, resume out. By the time you got actually engaged in a conversation with a recruiter or somebody, you weren't as aggravated. I mean, it was hard to change. Now it's easy to change. Oh, I'll change it. And I think that's uh, uh, one of the reasons why I think hiring is so screwed up, was we made uh, an inefficient process faster. And uh, uh, we've taken into the worst components of human nature uh, to say, hey, let's avoid short-term pain and let's give people average opportunities. And we're not, we wonder why they're unsatisfied after they start. It's kind of obvious to me, but I'm just an old timer who's whistling in the wind. To our listeners, I've encouraged you before, if you don't have a LinkedIn page to make one, makes it, it'll make a difference throughout your whole career. Um, and for those of you that have LinkedIn's, Shame on you for those who don't. And don't don't let anyone tell you that you're not qualified enough or your job isn't the right type to have a LinkedIn. You you can represent any type of work there. That said, Lou uh, has a huge following on LinkedIn. So I'd recommend you go go find Lou Adler, subscribe to him. You'll see his articles come through. You'll get much better content from you on your Lou on your news feed than you will uh, the garbage I see on mine. So, but you can learn from Lou and you can get that perspective on LinkedIn. That said, one of the things Lou speaks about is um, how to attract outstanding, diverse employees by throwing out the job description, in, in his words. I already like the sound of that, Lou. What's, tell us more about the idea behind that. Well, let's go back to that first assignment. Uh, the first assignment, I said, tell me what this person needs to do to be successful. And it was a series of performance objectives. I've always asked that question. Even for accounting, you have to have an MBA and have to have a CPA and have to do this. Has to have good communication skills. And I said, well, what does that look like on the job? Well, they got to do annual uh, reports to the executive board. Fine. I, I will not compromise on the reports to the executive board, but the fact that a person has seven or eight years of experience and be a white person who speaks perfect English um, is not the issue. The issue is they got to be able to make presentations to the executive board. So I've always focused on Defining a job is six to seven KPOs, key performance objectives. Now, after doing this for a bunch of years, I started realizing that companies actually were questioning the legality of doing that versus, you know, you got all these legal compliance issues, you got to have objective data. I went to the number one labor attorney in the country um, and asked him, can you use performance objectives? And he said, well, let me take a look. He wrote the book and he wrote a white paper. Uh, if you go to, uh, I think it's louadthegroup.com, I'm not I think that's it is, but um, you'll be able to download a white paper from David uh, Goldstein from Littler Mendelssohn. It says why performance objectives are more appropriate and legally compliant than a list of 10 years experience, a degree here and this, which to me is they're subjective, even though they have a number to them. Why is it seven years versus 10 years? Why is it an MBA from a top school from an MBA from any school or just 
the ability to do financial reporting. Uh, the idea is that managers and companies create criteria that they believe is uh, valuable and objective, and it's not proven. If they can do the work, and I tell my managers, if they can do the work, I won't compromise. They got to be able to do the work. That is legally sound, and it's also appropriate to open the talent pool to everybody who can do the work. Gender, non traditional candidates, older candidates, it doesn't matter <laughs> what their sexual preference is, none of that matters. If they can do the work, they deserve the job. And that is really the issue. And that's why I said earlier, the opening thing tip to hiring candidates is you got to ask the interviewer, what does this person need to do to be successful? I'd like to give you some stories or some examples of work that I've done that are most related. Number one, you'll get credit for just asking a question. Of course, you got to then answer it with examples, but that's a different issue. But if you can put both those together, you're in the game. Number one, you're assertive enough to ask the question and you're competent enough because you've done work that's related to that. Lou is the author of Hire With Your Head and also The Essential Guide for Hiring and Getting Hired. Lou, for there it is. If you're watching on the video, Lou's holding up the book. You can, I'm guessing we can find that on Amazon. Is that right? Well, I think you can, yes. And uh, we'll, we'll link to that in this episode's description. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But Lou, as we, as we start to wrap things up, on the essential guide on the getting hired spot, that's where our listeners are at. Could you give us one or two pieces of advice or um, ways to approach this advice for job seekers? What stands out to you as, as something that's important for someone who right now is thinking about upcoming interviews, thinking about getting their resume noticed? What should we have on our minds? What advice can you send us off with? Okay, well, if you go to winwinhiring.com, I have a learning platform, and part of that is a tool called the Candidate Prep. I got it. it I charge. It's a cup of coffee charge, but the company that hosts it charges me, so I just charge everyone out because we've got hundreds of people go on it. But in it, I say you've got to pre prep for the interview, and the way you prep is you write down your five or six major accomplishments before you go to the interview. And you have a story to prove each of those accomplishments. Technical competency. What's a great story that would prove technical competency? Uh, team project management. Write a story that would prove it. And during the and be and you prep and you and you got to answer each question for about two minutes long. You got to be able to tell the story. And I call it the SAFW response. Say a few words. Every answer has got to be two minutes, not longer, not shorter. Two minutes, maybe 90 seconds to two minutes, but it's in that frame. Opening statement, just a quick summary of uh, answer to the question. Amplify the statement. I really feel my technical competency in working with uh, uh, other collaborators who are, have a different background is my key strength. That's the amplification. Give an example. For example, we just put together a product roadmap for this product, and I got everybody, the product people, the engineering people, to agree that this is the way to go and optimize the solution. That takes about a minute and then summarize. So based on that example and other things that I've done related to that, I really feel my ability to bring technical and non-technical people together to work on a project is my greatest strength. That's called the SAFW response. You have to have each of your strengths and a story to prove each one of them. You do those things, you're in the game. At the end of the interview, however, because you're going to ask me this question, so I'll, pre I'll preempt you, Matthew. At the end of the interview, you ask the hiring manager, if any of those strengths have not been discussed, you say this, do you think project coordination is important to job success? They wouldn't, and they say, what? You think project coordination, whatever your greatest strength is, but you haven't discussed it yet in the interview. Hey, is project coordination important? We haven't discussed it. It seems like this job requires that. Oh, yeah, it is important. I said, great, let me tell you about a story that happened just last month, I love that. which I think would demonstrate my skills in that area. That's how you control the interview, by telling, making sure the hiring manager asks you questions that are relevant to your background and relevant to the job and things you can handle. You do those things, you're going to get an offer. Uh, you're going to get more offers than not anyway. Much to my shame, this is not interview advice I've given to our audience. I haven't shared this with you. If you like what Lou's saying, which you should, because I think it's great, it's winwinhiring.com. Is that right? Yeah. And sometimes you got to put the WW before it. You don't have to do it in Chrome. I don't know why that gets a techie issue, but winwinhiring.com will get you on different browsers. 
we'll we'll link to that in this episode's description too. So that'll be a click away, uh, and we'll we'll link to um, essential guide for hiring and getting hired. Lou, thanks for we're lucky to have your f- f- over forty years of experience, excellent experience. We're so lucky to have that shared with us today. Thank you. As you know, as we go out, the the audience we talk about this. It's stressful, not just being nervous, wondering maybe when the next paycheck's going to come. When is health insurance going to um, start up again with the next job? When is this all going to happen? We we know you're nervous. We know it's stressful. Listening to things like this and preparing, those are the tools to build your confidence and get what you want. With that said, Lou, can you give us a closing message here on uh, keeping our heads held high as we go through this process? Yeah, what I would say is if you don't get the interview, don't take it too badly. It just means that because you're not being assessed on your ability, you're being assessed on your interviewing skills. And that has nothing to do with if you're good or not. And I think candidates over, oh, I I screwed the interview up. Who cares? That's it. If you're a good person and practice what you do, you'll get more interview or more job offers than uh, normal. But if you don't screw up the interview, it has nothing to do with that because you'll probably misassess. Now, if there's totally a mixed match between you and your background, so be it. Uh, but more times than not, candidates don't get jobs just because they're not because they're a bad person. It's because they're a bad interviewer and has nothing to reflect on their long-term success or uh, what they think about their life or self-motivation in general. So given that, you go in there and say, hey, I hope I'm interviewed properly. And if you take the tips we've just talked about, you will be interviewed properly and you'll get the jobs you deserve. And that's really all you can do. Thank you again, Lou. Hope you'll join us again soon. And uh, we'll be following you in the meantime. Thank you.